Isabella, support. Good, you're on. Some sources date the history of rowing back to the 25th century BCE, back to the ancient Egyptian Empire, as well as the Roman Empire, where they used rowing as a form of transportation and as war vessels. Now, this video will be deceptive. It'll make it appear like rowing is an easy task. However, the true sign of an elite athlete is to make difficult things look easy. The 2000 meter event, which covers 1.25 miles, has been compared to playing two full court basketball games back to back with no break. This sport has also been compared to very physically intense sports such as long distance speed skating and cross country skiing. The sport of rowing has had a massive impact on the sporting landscape, both internationally and domestically. The, in the modern Olympics, one of the original sports was rowing. And the first intercollegiate sporting competition in the United States was a rowing competition between Harvard and Yale. In the recent Olympics, the United States rowing team made up the third largest delegation from the United States, only second to swimmers and athletics. Now, a little bit about our host team, Gonzaga University. Gonzaga University's rowing team began as a club sport in 1984 with just a few athletes, a Jesuit priest, and two wooden boats on nearby Lake Arthur. Six years later, the Zag women moved to Division I while working out of a boathouse on the Spokane River. Gonzaga's first NCAA championship was made possible by 18 walk-ons. In the 2018 West Coast Conference Championship, Varsity featured four walk-ons. Gonzaga Rowing has been winning West Coast Conference Championships for as long as the men's basketball team has. Their first victory came in 1997, and they've won over 17 titles since. With 57 young women on the roster, the women's crew can lay claim as the biggest sport at Gonzaga University. In recent years, the program has had about 10 scholarships annually, which means that the coaching staff has had to recruit athletes from other disciplines such as track and field, cross country, and other sporting disciplines. The Gonzaga University program counts itself amongst a long history of illustrious rowing teams. One of the first women's rowing team was formally established in 1908 and hit its stride in 1913 when Lucy Pocock took over as coach for the University of Washington. Pocock was a masterful oarswoman from England who once rowed so hard to win a race that she fainted when she crossed the finish line. She came from a family of rowers and boat builders, and her brother would go on to become a master builder of racing shells, renowned throughout the country. His name was George Pocock. Lucy grew up rowing and entered into as many competitions as possible, but there weren't that many competitions to compete in. Lucy moved to the United States of America in 1912, where she worked with the University of Washington to revive their women's rowing team. The program lasted until 1920 and was revived again in the 1970s. Back in those days, women were not judged on speed, but rather on their outfits and graceful sculling. With the passage of Title IX, women's rowing got a much needed boost. This meant that women rowers had the ability to participate in collegiate sports at the same level as male athletes, 
which opened the door for many amazing athletes to participate. Think about the turnaround. How do we get the blade locked and the wheels of the seat turn around, change direction? Pick it up at the front end, plant, bury the blade, get on the leg. Rowing is a very technical sport. The whole body is involved in moving a rowing shell through the water. Although rowing looks like an upper body sport, strong legs are really important. There are four parts of the rowing stroke. The catch, the drive, the release, and the recovery. And they all flow together in a smooth, continuous, and powerful movement. Steph, tell us a little bit about the catch. The catch is often referred to as the entry of the blade into the water, which should be done quickly and as a continuation of the recovery. It should be well synchronized with the speed of the boat without too much backsplash or front splash. Use the gravity of the weight of the blade instead of power to place the oar in the water. What about the drive? While executing the drive, the blade should remain buried in the water, moving horizontally and at even depth of approximately three to four inches. In order to maintain steady pressure, the drive should gradually accelerate from the entry to the final push of the boat to stay with the acceleration of the boat itself. Shoulders swing until the blade leaves the water. What about the release? The release of the blade from the water should follow the last push of the drive. The release should be quick, clean, fluid motion of the blade up and out of the water while still square. The feather turning the oar or the blades are parallel to the water surface, follows sequentially after the blade leaves the water. The whole path of the blade should be very horizontal during the drive, as well as during the recovery. That's my favorite part, the recovery. During the recovery, the blade travels toward the bow in smooth, horizontal plane at a steady height. There should be enough clearance to allow an easy squaring of the blade before the entry without skimming the surface of the water. Looking at this video, the sport seems so effortless. Rowing should be continuous, fluid motions, and rowers strive for the perfect synchronization. Clean catches of the oar blade is strategic because a lot of splash means the oars are not entering the water correctly. The catch should occur at the very end of the recovery when the hands are as far ahead of the rower as possible. Or blade coordination is a critical strategy, whereas the blades are brought out of the water. They should move horizontally at the same height, just above the water. Shells move slowest at the catch, quickest at the release, and so consistent speed is another strategy a good crew uses to maintain the speed of the shell or boat. Strokes per minute are stroke rates that vary from boat to boat, depending on the number of rowers, age, and size of the athletes. At the start, the stroke rate will be higher, anywhere from 36 to 44 strokes per minute for an eight. The rate will settle down at the middle of a race, anywhere from 30 to 36 for an eight. Finishing stroke rate can go into the high 40s for Olympic rowers. These are all strategies a crew or rowers in a boat may use when racing at a regatta in the pursuit of victory and a gold medal. What does rowing feel like? You should use the legs to accelerate the hull and push as much pressure as possible against the water by the time the legs are locking out. The oar is usually around the 
orthogonal 90 degree position or thereabouts. Then use the arms to pull on the handle fast enough to put a quick but definite bend in the blade. That is what it feels like to the rower and the coach can see this or capture the image on video as we did here. As soon as the oar has been bent, let go of the water. The bending action can be felt in the fingers and becomes a kinesthetic cue for the rower to start the release. Most coaches use the bending of the oar as a coaching tool. There should be no jerk to the stroke if the timing of the arm pull is correct and it is a technical task that can focus the rower on a discrete and very important part of the dry phase. Rhythm is the most important aspect of all, which is the ability of a rower to impart a strong and regular rhythm to the hull with his or her crewmates. Of course, setting a rhythm can depend on how well one executes the articulation of the stroke. Just like these athletes have to set a rhythm to perform at their best, photographers have to do the same. Stephanie, I think you have some questions associated with that. I do. The first one is, how does emotion and passion relate to photography, especially in this particular photo shoot? I think it definitely comes into play. If you can look, you look at these pictures, you can see that the weather was not the best that day. You know, it was cold, but you have to find that inner passion, that inner drive to get out there and get the shots because the best shots happen when the weather is not its best. And another aspect of photography when it comes to action in sports is natural light. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Natural light can be tricky. I mean, it looks great on camera, but you have to really look out for those shadows and kind of use it to your advantage as opposed to letting it be a disadvantage. Sometimes you can use those shadows to set the tone or the photo and truly articulate what's going on in the shot. Now, when you started this particular uh, session, uh, it was at night, correct? That's correct. But I wanted to get out there nice and early, so I had an opportunity to get comfortable in the situation because I find that the best pictures are taken when the subject is comfortable with the photographer as well as the photographer being comfortable with the subjects. Now, your camera is not as good in low light, so how did you handle that? So, yes, my camera is designed to blow pictures up really large. The R6 may have been a better selection, but what I did was I went out there with a clear image of what I wanted to, to achieve. So I determined what I had to set my camera on to get the message across that I was trying to convey. Another element in photography is space for impact. So the particular uh, image based on the uh, person or persons in the frame, is that correct? Yeah, and this picture that you're seeing in front of you is a perfect example of that. I could have gotten up really close to see the expression on their face and the twist in their muscle, but I think that zooming out and seeing the background, seeing the reflections on the water truly made an impact on the photo and helped to paint that picture to the audience of what was happening and the true passion that these athletes have for the sport. Tell me about ISO and why that was really important with this particular photo shoot. So like you said earlier, I got out there at nighttime. So I kind of had to determine what was the key element that had to be taken into consideration. And I knew that I could not get my ISO too high. For example, in this picture right here, I could have taken an ISO really high to try to capture this photo, but I knew if I did, the picture would be extra grainy. So I had to lower the ISO, lower the shutter speed so that I can get the picture to come out the way I wanted it to. Can you tell us a little bit about the memory card you use and why memory cards are really important, especially when it comes to action and sports photography? Memory cards are really important when it comes to action sites and photography. These are collegiate athletes, the best of the best. And when you press that shutter down, the write rate of that card is only so fast. So the better cards you buy, the higher the write rate is, which means you can take those pictures faster and you can ensure that you get the shot that you want to get. Both eyes open. I hear about that when it comes to action photography. Why would we need both eyes open? I think with most photography, you know, it's 
it, just like with shooting a rifle or anything else that requires precision, people close that one eye so that you can focus in on the subject. But in sports photography, you want to keep both eyes open so you can see out of your peripheral so you can ensure that you're not missing one thing. You're not just locked, laser focused on that one thing and missing something key going on in a different area. Shooting in silhouette, I noticed you use that here in this particular uh, photography shoot. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, like I said earlier, you know, I think that it's key to keep in mind what the tone of the photo is and using those shadows and those highlights to help articulate the story. So you want to use those silhouettes in some of the photos like you see here. You can use the silhouette to kind of use as a leading line or draw your attention into one area of the photo and to help paint the picture. Can you tell us a little bit about depth of field and why that would be important in sports photography? So that is a very good question. So depth of field can be a really good, unique, good tool to use when taking pictures because it helps to draw that eye in to the subject. However, in situations like this, you really want the whole shot to be in focus. You want to be able to see every bit of the photo. So you want to use a higher f-stop to ensure that that depth of field is wide enough so that you can see every aspect of the photo. Like this photo here, if I would have had a low depth of field, you would only be able to see the athlete's face as opposed to being able to see the whole shot in focus. Now, can you tell me about angles and why that would be important? So angles can be important because you really want to take in consideration the story that you're trying to tell making sure that you're not assuming that the audience knows what you're trying to say. So you want to try different angles to see which one has the greatest impact. So that being said, sports photography can be very challenging, but very rewarding as well. So get out there and get the shot.